Okay, welcome to the sixth slideshow for Victory Garden. We're going to be looking at September through November 2011, and we'll be looking at what happens when stress test becomes almost like a living nightmare for those who have to take care of it. Um, and we'll note we'll see some successes, uh, some failures. We'll talk about what happens when the support isn't there, the support that you expected to be there wasn't there. Uh, I'm hoping not to dwell on that too much. This is like the sixth, seventh time that I've had to uh, try to re-record this because it's it's just so emotionally devastating. Um, when I, yes, okay, it's a garden, but if you've seen the other five slideshows, you've seen that for seven months, um, you know, I, I poured my energy and my heart into the garden uh, with the expectation that at least more than my mother would be enjoying it. I mean, uh, she wasn't the only one eating the produce from it. Uh, the rest of my family would merrily and happily eat the tomatoes and have the salads and eat, uh, you know, the cucumbers. Whatever food came out of the garden, it was eaten. It was eaten by the whole family, and then to, to thrust the burden of taking care of it onto one person was just entirely wrong, um, you know. And that's that's I guess all I can really say about that because this is a public video. But uh, you know, just imagine coming back and seeing this is your first thing. Uh, you know, here's so part of the Green Guild. Let's we'll flip to the next picture of the Green Guild. Just look at it. I mean, it's it's over. You don't even know that this was a garden. It just looks like weeds were growing everywhere. Um, you can't even tell that there are beds here. These there are double dug beds in here that are perfect location for growing food, and uh, it's just overrun by grass. And grass is my it was the worst thing because grass is so hard, and it, and it uh, once it gets its root, it's so hard to get out. That's why we. I spent months stripping the grass off of the soil when we were going to prep a bed. Uh, you know, it's crazy, uh, just crazy. And when it goes to seed, that's even harder because now you're going to have all these grass seeds that are going to lay in wait until the time's right for them to pop back up. <sighs> but you've got, you know, and you've got morning glories that are creeping around. Not quite as crazy in here because it doesn't get as much sun as some of these other locations. Um, yeah, some of the other areas of the garden fared a lot better. This is part of the nightshade guild uh, with the tomatoes and peppers. It did a little bit better because my mother was uh, really keen on saving what she could. I mean, she had only she was only one out there doing anything really. Uh, so uh, you know, she had to kind of pick her battles. Um, you know, here, and you can tell she's kind of given up at this point with uh, harvesting, just trying to keep the plants alive, not even getting out there to harvest. There's There are dozens of tomatoes in just this picture. Uh, and then this next picture, look at all the tomatoes on the left that are on the vines that aren't being picked. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was a heartbreaker, really, to come back and see this after all the healthy growth that I left it with. Uh, to come back and see this, but at least some of the a lot of the plants that we did put in, like lemon balm and the other perennials, were still alive. The oregano was, uh, thyme. Like I said, these these perennials, they, they were the main things I wanted to keep alive because obviously the annuals are going to pass away regardless of how well you take care of them. They're going to die uh, eventually. And here's another picture with uh, tomatoes strewn across the ground. You know, one one good thing about the demise of the tomato plants was that it opened up a lot more sunlight for the peppers. There's two pepper plants at the bottom of this screen, and the the, the big plant in here is lemon balm. Uh, next picture, looking into the Four Sisters Guild from the Nightshade Guild, the comfrey plants are really strong. Uh, they're right along the swale, and then you've got uh, covering up the remains of sunflowers which of course sunflowers are and these sunflowers are annuals so we didn't really expect to see them i didn't expect to see them alive when i came back uh covering them are more of morning glories and and i had to go through the entire garden and hand pick and remove morning glory seed pods from the entire garden everywhere everywhere i went i had to before 
wringing these vines, ripping these vines out, the, you know, chopping them from the bottom and then ripping them out. I had to get the seeds because these seeds, you know, I'm, you're going to create a seed bank and you're going to have a morning glory farm instead of a, um, you know, instead of a garden, really. Let's move some other pictures. Uh, okra, okra did really well. Okra, you, you can't kill okra. I know I've said that before. Uh, we didn't, family doesn't eat too much okra, but it's fun to grow, structures the soil really well, you know, tolerates drought, tolerates neglect, um, insect damage, and everything else. At the foot of this bed, there's a really large lemon balm, um, there's basil, bottom left, bottom right center, eggplants are doing much better now, they're not really great looking plants, but they were you know, near death when we transplanted them. Here's the massive cosmos that the, uh, was, you know, over a meter across. Look at how many cosmos plants it's put out. And how many of these cosmos plants are going to be producing seed by fall? Uh, that's how quickly it can spread throughout the garden. Not all bad news. Great, Lulo, great blue lobelia beginning to flower, survive six weeks that I was gone. Here's uh, more of the Four Sisters Guild, just, you know, covered in Morning Glories. Another picture of it, Morning Glories. Um, now remember this, this has been covered in cantaloupes and watermelons when I left, and uh, now, it, now it's just dead and full of grass, seedy grass. Yeah, you can see the pond has been filled, at least the, <laughs> at least the fish didn't die. Um, another picture of four sisters. You know, it's just really, it is, it is emotional, it's crazy to think about it, and it still strikes me looking at these, that I'm, I'm trying to just talk about what, what's going on here, uh, but to know that people were benefiting from the garden and then wouldn't lend a hand is um, just makes me shake my head every time I think about it. And, and it was a lot, you know, it was, this was a huge garden. It's not like this was going to be, you know, easy to take care of. But the, the fact that I wasn't even informed that these dramatic changes were taking place, nobody let me know that uh, the garden had completely fallen apart. Um, no one had told me this whatsoever, so I wasn't expecting to see this when I came back. Um, just just goes to show like who you, who who you can really put your trust into. Uh, you know, you think it would be your family, but um, you know, and <laughs> and how honest people are about you know, because everybody was you know, my brother didn't care, but he wasn't going to live here much longer anyway. Uh, but everybody else was behind it. Everybody else thought that this was a good idea. Let's have a uh, we're, we're, it's going to be a forest anyway. If you remember the first slideshow, this is going to be a forest anyway, so why don't we get it to the point where these trees are going to be healthy and you're not going to have, be out there mowing. Nobody likes mowing. They don't like mowing. Uh, you know, So offering an alternative paradigm and then not having that uh, you know, taken care of is just mind-boggling. But at least this whole slideshow won't be like this. It's just these first few pictures where I'm trying to show you uh, how overgrown and it messed up everything was, but at least, like I said, like the comfrey plants, you're not going to kill the comfrey, they're still alive, so our nutrient net, or the beginnings of a nutrient net, are still in place. Um, this is crazy though, you know, the blueberry mounds, completely, completely overgrown, you know, here's another one, you know, dare you to find the blueberry underneath that. And blueberry plants, we, we you know, they were given to us as a gift. Um, not not that having paid for plants mattered because we paid for all these other plants, paid for the seed and the time to uh, you know put them in the ground would matter. But just the idea that if these were to die and have to be replaced, you're looking at you know twenty plus dollars per plant usually to get a healthy plant from an organic blueberry grower. Uh, you're looking at hundreds of dollars just gone. Uh, but at least some of the plants survived underneath this massive freaking morning glories that just attacked us from the mulch. That's one reason why importing organic matter isn't something you want to addict your garden to because you never know what you're going to bring. Um, you can see that the grass has been mowed, partly. 
And that hey, mowing the grass is one thing if you mow it on the highest setting, but look at this picture. Look at the scalping. Look at the destruction. This used, this before I left, was overgrown with, quote, weeds. Yeah, sure, there were weeds. But they were protecting the soil. They were competing with the grass so that the trees, this is right next to the one of the plum trees, our, our ornamental plum, so that that plum tree wouldn't be competing with the grass anymore, that the soil would be structured and protected under a thick layer of vegetation. And then to come back and see that the fence had been removed, the protective fence had been removed, and they scalped it. Uh, they took the lawnmower and just scalped the living hell out of the lawn. Um, here's a picture of this relative of the Vietnamese mint, uh, which was growing all over the garden. It's a really weedy plant, but it was one of the only ones that was providing uh, pollen, so we let it go throughout the fall so that at least the insects would have some form of food. Um, turn, like I said, it turned out to be really weedy the next year because you imagine how many seeds that produced. But look at, uh, talking about the scalping again, this is a picture from the 18th of September. Looking out the second story window, I've uh, begun to clean up, if you will, to try to get a handle on what's going on. You see how the fence got moved? So I've lost all the mounds that are on, running along the back fence. There are, you know, another, like a third of the mounds. A third of the entire berm was just cut off from us. Uh, and then they scalped everything. You can see the dead grass. You can see where the clay is just showing up. Um, all this had been vegetated. And then underneath the birch trees, we had a nice crop of white clover that was fixing nitrogen and you know there wasn't any grass and it was protecting the soil starting to build organic matter and it has been completely scalped and the worst thing about that is a south facing slope uh, a south facing slope if you you know rip off the vegetative layer you just expose it to the, to the sun and it's going to be baked again um, you see the amount of vegetation I've had to pull out underneath the oak center right look at all this this mound of uh, brown um, took a long time to do it too. Here's, you know, just another picture from the windows. Uh, it doesn't look like I've done too much, but I've cleared out a whole lot of the morning glories and that took so, so, so long because if you apply any amount of pressure to, uh, you know, to the right couple places on the seed pod, it's going to explode open and seeds just fly everywhere in the garden. Uh, Pounds and pounds of morning glory seeds I had to retrieve from the vines before I could pull them out. I've begun dismantling the trellises, the tomato cages, uh, starting to move to another, uh, you know, <laughs> the next, the next phase, the next phase. Um, here's a cool picture. Here's a cardinal flower. Again, one of these perennials that's not supposed to flower in the first year, but it's doing it anyway. Really, really pretty. And this one, it will attract a lot of hummingbirds later on once we get enough established and it's more than just one flower spike. You can see why, too. You can see that's a perfect plant for hummingbirds. Here's another picture of four sisters after I've removed a whole lot. At least there's still a lot of mulch. You know, at least the mulch is still there protecting the soil. Um, you know, so it's, re it's ready for the next stage. And, and we're going to get to that very shortly. Um, Jumping to the 22nd now. Uh, now that I've cleaned out a whole lot of the garden, I'm just starting to observe again and trying to take a break and focus on the positive. And here's here's a nice positive basil. And basil is just a, the most amazing nectary for all types of insects. Uh, I think there's six or seven flowers in each little ring on each stem, so you can imagine how nice it is for bees to walk up and down these flower spikes in order to collect pollen and nectar. Uh, jalapenos coming on. Great Lulo, great blue, I keep saying great blue, great blue lobelia uh, flowering. Again, not supposed to, it was first year, really pretty. Really pretty. Amazing that it was actually in early 2012, before I even left for Europe, it was uh, it was flowering again. So really hardy. You know, okra just wouldn't stop growing. And uh, even started to get a 
second crop of large tomatoes. So not, you know, th things respond. Um, you know, I remember in the last slideshow I talked about intent and, and your, uh, your feelings towards the plants and everything. Um, I can't help but think that some of this was due to the animosity towards the project by the rest of the family. Uh, I mean, that, that sounds like crazy hippie bullshit, but you just look at it. I mean, it, it's overgrown, it's crazy, um, and it's a, it's more, it's like almost like a positive feed or a negative feedback loop, really, more not really positive, that if you don't like what's happening out there, uh, so you're going to avoid the you can avoid doing the work that needs to be done because you hate it. And of course, since you're avoiding the work that needs to be done, the plants are going to take advantage of that. Uh, so there's there's a lot going on if you, if you want to talk about uh, your intent in the garden. Look at these, look at all those uh, cherry tomatoes that are hidden here. I, I still haven't gotten to these mounds yet. And uh, another thing that was just uh, unbelievable really to me was that my brother had offered to... Uh, dig out the lower pond while I was gone. I was like, oh, that's great. I told him what to do, take the take the dirt out and put it on these Hugo mounds. I showed, told him what to do. And it's really easy. You, you load up a wheelbarrow and you dump the wheelbarrow on a mound. That, that's all there is to it. Well, he and his friends did a lot of digging, but they dumped all the dirt in one place. This actually, I guess I probably should bring in a picture of all this dirt, uh, but we're talking probably a good ton of North Carolina clay just dumped into one place. Um, so I had to, you know, when I when I finally had time, I, I had to, by myself, fix it. So I had to move, that that dirt got moved twice. It didn't need to be moved twice. This is what I'm talking about with uh, just the animosity. Like, what, if you're going to volunteer to do something, do it right. Like, don't, don't say that you know... Um, you, that you understand what's being asked of you and then and then go off and do the complete opposite. Um, but that sort of ends the negative, the real negative stuff. Um, he, here is the 14th of October, so fall is moving in. Um, you can tell that we've got a handle on the garden now and the stress test is over. Thank, thank God the, the, the stress test is over. Uh, the stress test again. We would never plant a garden that big. But that wasn't the intent. The intent wasn't to grow a garden with a million plants that needed a whole bunch of care every single year. So it's not like that was something that was going to be done year in and year out. Uh, the whole reasoning behind it, if you want to go back to the last slideshow, you you can hear about it, is to show the microclimates to show. Uh, what needs to be done and everything, and yes, it was to see the limits of ourselves, um, but it was it was almost as though they expect they were like, oh my goodness, he thinks we're going to take care of this every year. Um, you know, it, it, we're really moving to a cover crop uh, in in the fall now, and um, they knew, and this is something that they knew that I had told them that we discussed. Um, but things got a whole lot better come fall and once I had everything under control again and tried to sit them down and explain to them what was going on again. Because again, this was something that they had said that they wanted. You know, I didn't force this upon the family. Uh, Green Guild on the right, Old Nightshade Guild on the left, under control. Green Guild, just green as could be, full cover crop, white clover, dandelions, comfrey, lemon balm, all dynamic accumulators. Still haven't gotten to those blueberry mounds. Taking the trellis from the upper pond. The lighting is so much different in the fall. It's just so much... Uh, you, you can tell it's getting cooler and the days are just... They're getting shorter, but something about, you know, as the shadows grow longer, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, it's something everyone notices. Everyone notices this kind of thing when you're just going about your day-to-day -day life. But I think gardeners are in a whole lot more uh, in tune with the the change in seasons. I mean, that's sounds it's obvious, but 
there's a lot to this. This isn't just um, putting plants out and, you know, hoping for the best. Anyway, we've got in this picture, you're looking at common vetch, fixing nitrogen, replacing uh, the nitrogen that had been taken by the corn and the four sisters. It was our main nitrogen fixer for the Four Sisters Guild. And I've also got some experimental sunflowers in there. And we also have a lot of uh, fall cool season crops like daikon radish and uh, cabbages and mustards and everything that's interplanted in here, especially in this bed, a lot of cabbage. Um, a long green line that runs along the bed is white clover. So we're doing our white clover pathways in all of the garden now. Again with the Nightshade Guild. And we came across a good windfall. A neighbor had his uh, ornamental pears taken down. Everybody, you remember the storms have damaged these trees and knocked them down. So I drug the whole tree by hand into the backyard and disassembled it into branches and leaves. And I built a nest around the maple tree of the branches and then I filled in the branches with uh, leaves and the branches would allow more airflow so we'd get aerobic breakdown of the leaves throughout the winter and fall uh, and then early spring as if I just put them on a big layer then they could you know get washed away the wind would blow them away and then with the lack of oxygen they wouldn't break down as well and they could actually form a water resistant barrier uh, here's a closer picture of just like the, how, how many branches we put down. This. So think about all the carbon. We've got short-term carbon input from the leaves, and we have a longer carbon input that those mycorrhizal fungi are going to be able to uh, break into as the years go on with the branches. And you can see how nice the, the beds are now in this old nightshade guild especially with some closer pictures here. I mean, there's cilantro and thyme, oregano, lemon balm, clovers, radishes, cabbages, cosmos, uh, crimson clover. I mean, the diversity is now beginning to go towards the permaculture end of the spectrum, which is right where we need to go. Uh, next picture, another bed in the old nightshade guild you can see you can see very clearly the white clover border um, and all these sprouts that are coming up in the old nightshade guild we used alfalfa and red clover as our main uh, as our main cover crop for nitrogen fixation and they're perennial of course they're perennial so we're, we're gonna have a nice perennial cover crop here we're experimenting with the difference between the perennial and the annual cover crop uh, the basil still going even though it's October tomatoes still going in October and this is the, that's the willow tree there eggplants peppers one single flower from uh, white dotted mint. Which, there's probably three or four other common names. There's a lot of common names for this, but it's in the Monarda family, and it's going to be a, a native, low to the ground, spreading, generalist nectary plant, as well as uh, a tea plant. They make good tea from it. And you can see some insects have already found it. There's out of focus this kind of orangish, uh, orangish guy, and a little, another little guy, and there's yeah, it's it's amazing when you stop spraying, uh, what kind of diversity will come in just a year. Mexican tarragon going to flower, which is good because not only for nectar, but Mexican tarragon is supposed to only be hardy to zone 8. Uh, so in 7, if you can get it to seed enough, you can. it might turn into, and it did, it turned into a, a self-seeding annual for us. So we'll have uh, a good wild marigold doing its nematode fighting action, uh, you know, perennial, perennially. Here's a wild daisy that we've let go to flower again for more nectar and then also for uh, niche requirements for spiders. Spiders, because so you can see the bamboo poles around, spiders continued to make webs and so I kept 
I took down a lot of the poles, but I did keep the poles that had active spider webs growing in them. And it really opened up the space too by taking down those poles. Here's in the green guild, we've got lettuce that was self-seeded coming up. So you've got death and regrowth. This is what permaculture is all about, is playing in, with the cycles and getting in tune with the cycles in order to uh, have a productive garden. Now let's go to the last set of pictures. This is November 9th. Uh, look at this harvest of tomatoes and jalapenos and, every, and there's even some eggplants in November. So that's how warm our climate is. Uh, most people aren't getting tomatoes and peppers in this quantity anymore. There's a lot of people who do, uh, but for a first year garden, we were really happy. And those yellow cherry tomatoes were actually pretty good. Outside, you know, remember the photo, the, my photography skills are still kind of uh, not really good. Um, come the next slideshow, you'll see that they, they get, I mean, I'm, I'm not a wonderful wildlife photographer, blah, blah, blah. But the quality gets a lot better because I learned a whole lot in December about photography. Uh, but here's the extent of our cover cropping in November. Everything, all the beds are pretty much 100% covered in vegetation. You know, here's the old four sisters with the common vetch carpet, and there's interplanted in here, you know, carrots and mustard, arugula. Um, cabbage, radishes, beets. A lot of them didn't do very well because we planted the seeds out too late. But again, that's something you learn. You don't know these things the first time you do them. Uh, and remember, I was <laughs> spending the initial part of fall just trying to get a handle on the garden and get some of these really weedy seeds out. You know, we've got the red clover and alfalfa cover crop doing really well in this picture with the uh, our willow tree. And you can see that we've sense, uh, actually not yet, but we're beginning, we're getting ready to remove those poles that are holding it up because it's now growing straight up instead of bending over. Another picture of the nightshade guild. Four sisters again, a little bit closer. Even closer with a Vetch. The vetch is a great green cover, color, and you'll see it uh, through the rest of winter and then into the spring, just how beautiful it is. Uh, and you can see the, our mustard and everything else. So this is what you want to see. You want to have a cover crop because, as you may know, you, sh you probably do know this if you've been doing a lot of permaculture, but plants are converting water and sunlight along with nutrients into sugars. You know, that's pretty much how they feed themselves through photosynthesis. But they don't use all the sugars themselves. Uh, they don't keep it to themselves. They share it through their roots to feed microorganisms, beneficial microorganisms. Uh, so having plants growing as long as possible in your climate means that you're working the soil at all levels uh, throughout the year as long as possible and that you're going to grow you're going to build your soil a whole lot quicker than if we had decided not to cover crop and just bring in more mulch next year uh, this is how we start getting onto that path of renewed fertility on site here's a bamboo trellis with some peas here's some of the mounds that I've since moved all that dirt to and uh, planted some kale into with this one they're all south facing. You can see we zoomed out a little bit. They're all south facing. So in the fall, they get a whole lot of sunlight and you can grow. We should be able to grow a fair amount of crops on these, even though in the summer, they're pretty much fully shaded by the pine trees. Again, just showing you how thick the coverage is of our ground cover. Top left of the picture, not as much. I didn't plant any vetch in there. I'm not sure exactly why but I did plant it we planted it really heavily with uh, cabbages and radishes here's some uh, here's more of these pears our last ornamental pear and you can see its stump if you look directly to the center then all the way to the top 
you can see that there's a stump there and that's where a storm had knocked down our last ornamental pear. Uh, so chopped it up and we brought it into the garden so uh, we'd have more mulch and more uh, woody material that's going to be habitat for uh, small birds and, and a good place for reptiles to hide. Here's a tomato that's growing underneath our oak tree, protected a little bit with some branches from uh, the northern winds. Uh, spinach, using stones around the seedlings in order to uh, increase the heat. Again with that dotted mint. And the last picture, uh, just the upper pond with the, the fish that are waiting for me to get all this, the, the pine needles out. Uh, but they survived throughout the whole winter and uh, hopefully this wasn't too much of a downer of a slideshow. Uh, it's not going to be like this for the rest of them. And it was just hard to um, hard to talk about. It was, it was it's a hard slideshow, but in order for the continuity of this series, it, it's kind of necessary to see it. But as you can tell, we've we've made a whole lot of progress. Let me uh, go back to some of these other pictures and show you, so we don't end on that one. Uh, you know, we've got a handle on it, and in a cover crop is something that we'll be able to, my parents are going to be able to handle. Uh, it's not demanding by its very nature, by its very nature it's uh, it's like a band, it's like a bandage really. Um, it's a wonderful way to ease into permaculture. So we'll talk more about the benefits of cover cropping and you'll see how it went throughout the winter in the next slideshow. Um, but we're going to call it a day on that one.